All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Welcome back to another presentation in our series of webinar events jointly hosted between Research Square Company and um, the Mars uh, Training Network, the Mars Hub uh, Researcher Training Network. It's my pleasure to be here um, once again. My name is Gareth Dyke. And today, in this presentation, we're going to talk about English language mistakes and how to avoid them in your academic writing. I like to call this presentation Fantastic Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I don't know if you're Harry Potter fans or J.K. Rowling fans, but that's a bit of a play on that. So this is me. I worked for a number of years at the University of Bristol in New York, in Ireland, back in the UK and also in Hungary, publishing my own academic work, more than 300 academic papers that I've published myself, as well as working for companies like Research Square, most recently doing training and providing professional services to researchers around the world. I'm also a journal editor, working for almost 18 years now, I know, for a journal published by Taylor and Francis called Historical Biology. So in all this time and all of this um, uh, work that we've done, um, it has um, enabled us to provide lots of um, content and lots of services and lots of ideas to help researchers manage their English writing. Because of course we edit hundreds of thousands of papers every year at Research Square Company. So um, that's um, something that I wanted to point out at the start of this presentation. Many of the tips and many of the tricks that you're going to see in this presentation are based upon lots of editing work. Lots of editing work. And I see somebody's posting in the chat that the link that I posted is invalid. I'm just checking it now and it works. Resources dot aje.com forward slash digital hyphen editing hyphen web. I've just checked it on my computer and it is indeed working. Farouk is here. Farouk, how are you doing? I'm a huge fan of Farouk's. It's great to see that you're here joining us today. So who are we? Research Square Company founded in 2004. We've supported more than two and a half million authors in almost 200 countries through our preprint server. Have a look at the Research Square Company preprint server, researchsquare.com. That's one part of our business. The other part of what we do to help researchers around the world is aje.com, American Journal Experts. We have lots of digital tools, including our digital editing tool, which as Naram was saying at the beginning, we've just published an analysis. We've just published a white paper. You can download it or I'll share it with you at the end, talking about how this digital editing tool is more effective for academic researchers than the competitor tools, most, of, most common of which of course is Grammarly. So if you're an academic and you want to get your work quickly evaluated, quickly edited for publication in an international journal, then of course, potentially, this would be something that you would go for and have a look at to begin with at the start of the process. Now, of course, English academic communication, we all get letters like this all the time. Dear sir, dear madam, many thanks for asking whether we would like to publish your paper. It's good and original, but unfortunately, we're not willing to publish it. The trouble is, of course, that the good bits were not original and the original bits were not good. One of the key issues around the world for researchers writing and publishing their academic work is the English standard of language in the content, in the paper, when it goes into that international journal. And of course, there should be no difference between the standard of language in a paper that anyone should write anywhere in the world. So one of the key things that we are aiming to do, one of the key motivators for me, for us, for the work that I do, the training that I'm providing, the, the content that we're providing, that we're trying to put out to help researchers around the world, is of course to address this issue. International publishers often reject our excellent research because of a number 
of issues. And this is a survey of publishers. Papers outside the journal scope, plagiarism, incorrectly formatted articles, English, as well as reviewer responses and recycled submissions. Today, we're going to talk about English language issues, but of course, we're very happy. We're more than happy. We'd be delighted to have you back for more of these Mars Research Hub webinars in the future to talk about many of these other issues as well. So don't go away. If you've enjoyed this presentation, if you find it to be useful, do get in touch with Naran, do get in touch with me. We'd love to provide further training for your institution. Now, of course, writing in English provides poor results if the English is ambiguous. And I just found a few examples from the internet here that show that your academic research message, your content, your communication, your language in the way that you write should not be buried in language issues. I'll say it again, there's no reason why the research done in any country around the world is any different to the research done anywhere else. But often international journals have issues with that content because of the English. And so one of our goals one of the things that we're here to do is to help people manage that. Because, of course, English is the universal language of scientific communication. And we know, and of course, potentially, you will also begin and become, understand that English academic papers do need to be well written and often to a higher standard of English than you might see in other writing. So I would say that we are here to show you, to help you, to convince you that the academic writing process as a creative process should be beneficial to your academic future, to your intellectual activity in its own right. The big question, of course, is how? So I do begin these presentations about English academic communication by introducing people to my heroes, Winston Churchill, a journalist called Hadley Freeman, and another English journalist called A.A. A. Gill. Winston Churchill, very famous uh, British Prime Minister, he was well known, he was said to have been able to mobilize the English language and send it into battle. JFK, the US president from the 1960s, 1970s, he said this, of course, and I also learned from writing courses from training courses that I attended when I was a little bit younger, from journalists like Hadley Freeman, that when you start to think to write in a second language, the best way to do that is to write down your thoughts, your information in the way that you think. Not worry about the grammar, not worry about the punctuation, not worry about the correctness of the English, but to write down exactly in the way that you think. And that's very important as a technique, as a tip for colleagues thinking and writing in a second or third language. We'll help you to edit, we'll help you to put the content together in an effective way a little bit later. But having the chance, the ability to write down your thoughts, manage that later as you work on the content. So there are writers like Good old A.A. A. Gill, you can see him here on the right hand side of the slide, a really brilliant food and travel writer who was unable to actually write. He was so dyslexic that he couldn't write down anything. He just talked into a voice recorder, into a dictaphone, and that information, that content, that writing was transcribed later. So if you're able to spend a few moments every day thinking in English, trying to write a little bit and often in English, then you will be getting closer towards your goal of being an effective communicator. I would also say that it's important to ask yourself when you're faced with writing an assignment or another challenging document, how do you feel about that task ahead? How do you start writing? Do you carefully construct a plan beforehand or do you just make it up as you go along. What kind of writer are you? Because if you're not like Arnold, if you're not a bricklayer, if you don't have the writing structure in place before you begin, then you should do. Because as I always like to say in these training sessions, before beginning to write a paper, you do need to have in place your message. What's the key takeaway from your research article? What's your message? 
who are your audience going to be? Which journal are you going to be submitting your paper to? And what will the structure of your writing be? Of course, that can come from your target journal, finding and selecting and targeting and making pre-submission inquiries to journals before beginning the writing process is a great strategy to be effective as a writing and publishing researcher. You need a plan. We can learn from those who came before us. That's what this presentation is all about. But you need your message. Think about your audience, your target journal, and think about the structure of your writing before you begin. And then we'll start to jump in and think about how it can be done in English. People always ask us, how can I write in English? Well, try to think in English and write as you think a little bit every day. And top tip. Number one tip, key insight from our experience, find papers in your field that you like and that you respect that you have seen published in your research area recently that you can base your work on. It's absolutely critical. We're not saying that you should copy. We don't want that. We don't want you to plagiarize, but you will be aware of leading researchers in your field working in the same area. Perhaps they're from native English speaking countries, you can go and have a look at their CVs online, you can download some of their recent articles, you can base your own papers on how they structure their introduction, their abstract, their methods, their figure captions, all of those great bits of the article. And also, I would say before we dive into the English language mistakes section of this presentation, if you're going to use a translator, if you're going to get your ideas your work translated, then please, 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 please find somebody who has knowledge of your subject area, because that is very important. A lot of information gets lost in translation in particular subject areas. So to begin, of course, we are looking for plain English, very different for writing academic work in other languages. English, most of the English papers that are written and published around the world are read by non-native speakers. They're also written by non-native speakers. So keep your English simple, short sentences, no unnecessary words, familiar words. Try to use the active voice where possible rather than the passive voice. And we'll teach you about effective style. We'll teach you about punctuation, but there are key features of plain, effective English language that you can learn from the experience of journal editors around the world and keeping in mind as you write your papers that of course, most of the papers written and published around the world in English are written and also read by non-native speakers. Big difference to lots, if not all, other languages where academic work is published. I'm thinking of French, I'm thinking of Russian. Most of those papers, of course, when written in that language will only be read by other native speakers. So let's avoid those long sentences. Let's avoid the passive tense. We concluded, not it can be concluded, that because of course you're using more words and it's harder for your reader to understand your meaning. One or two complex ideas maximum in one sentence. Keep the sentences short. The average effective length for an English language sentence about 20 words and never, never longer than 50 words. One topic per sentence. Construct your sentences around ideas, Let's talk a little bit later about topic sentences, but you just want one idea per sentence and one key idea per paragraph. So cut out those unnecessary adjectives, no jargon, short and simple words, and of course, no double negatives. We see this a lot as well in our editing work. Phrases like malaria is not uncommon, when of course the authors mean malaria is common. So. <laughs> That's an example of a double negative. Let's try to cut those out of our writing because we do see them all the time. So just some ideas, some basic ideas for you to have a think about the next time that you are putting your articles together. Now, here, 
are the most common mistakes that we see in English academic writing. Plagiarism by mistake, because of course, nobody listening to this would ever, ever consider to copy text or information or figures or content from another published paper. Tenses and switches, we'll talk about that in a moment. Those those pesky spelling conventions and the inappropriate use of words and word use confusion. So we're gonna talk through these different sections, plagiarism, tenses and switches, spelling conventions and inappropriate word use and confusion. So what is plagiarism? Well, this of course means the inappropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results or words without giving appropriate Credit. Of course, you're doing um, plagiarism if you are taking or using something from another paper that's not yours. So stealing somebody else's words or ideas. And this, of course, is academically dishonest because everybody's expected to do their own work. So plagiarism is a big issue in the academic environment and beyond. The use of information without crediting its source can harm your academic credibility. So if you're going to make use of the work of others, use the, if you're going to make use of the work of others to gather information or use the work of another and call it your own, or make use of the works of others to support your argument, or indeed examine the works of others to create or shape an argument, you must cite the source. Very important, we provide detailed training on this particular aspect of writing, but many authors, unfortunately, around the world are unaware of this particular issue, and it's called self-plagiarism. If you're going to use a data set from one of your previous studies, published or not, you've got to make the reader aware of this. You can't submit a manuscript for publication containing data, conclusions, or passages that have already been published. You need to cite your previous work and you can't publish multiple similar papers about the same study in different journals. So lots of authors end up getting in trouble with publishers, with journals, because they think, oh, well, you know, I, I published that figure. It belongs to me. I can use it again in one of my later studies. Well, you can, of course but you need to cite the previous piece of work. Or indeed, if it's been published in a traditional journal, you also probably need to get permission from the copyright holder. I know even if you made the figure or made the map or made the image and you've published in a traditional journal, you've probably signed over the copyright, the image rights to the publisher. Of course, one of the big advantages of open access publishing is that you, the author, get to retain the copyright, but you still always need to cite your previous work. It's, I know, can be a little confusing. It happened to me a few times in my earlier career. You tend to think, I own that figure, I made that figure, I made that map, but you do need to cite if you've published it before. So self-plagiarism, any attempt to take any of your previously published text, papers, research results, um, you know, and, and put it into a, another paper and make it appear brand new. So that's problem number one. That's issue number one in English academic writing, plagiarism, in particular, self-plagiarism. Issue number two, question number two that authors have about English writing is this one, which tense to use in each section of my paper? Well, don't get tense. It's actually quite simple because we're trying to keep our writing simple and effective. So if you can, try to use the simple present tense in as much of your academic writing as possible. Of course, there will be exceptions to this, most notably the method section where you're talking about things that happened already. So that section of the paper will be um, consistent will be containing a lot of writing in the past tense. But of course, as you can see here, the present tense is appropriate mostly for accepted facts, such as background information presented in the introduction. So use the present tense when you talk about your results and conclusions, or indeed when describing your methods, we would say it's best potentially to use the past tense. So 
tensors and switches, very important. Of course, if you go on over to aje.com, if you jump on over to that website, you'll find a resources section on there. I believe that Naran and her team are going to start to translate some of the blog articles and some of the content that we have on aje.com, at least the introductions to some of these articles into Arabic. So we can also provide them for people as a snippet so that you can jump in and you can, you know, click on those. You can read the Arabic introduction and then jump in and read the English section. Tip number three, area number three for issues in English academic writing is, of course, spelling conventions between good old A-E American English and good old B-E British English, as you can see here. So lots of spelling differences, also some differences in tense use between the American English and the British forms. Did you know, for example, that our friends in America spell the color gray differently to the way that we spell the color gray in English? And one of the things that really bothers editors that can be really an issue, and by the way, is corrected for you if you use the AJE digital editing tool, because you get to pick when you upload your paper, which language you're going to want to have the paper edited into. It's possible to fix all of these issues as you begin the process of writing or at the end when you're going through and proofreading your paper. But spelling conventions, I've edited lots of papers where there's lots of mix up between the American English and the British English. Journals will give you style guidelines or they'll tell you, we prefer that you use British English or that you use American English, or they'll just say, we don't mind so long as the paper is consistent. And that's the key thing really, that at the end of the day, you should be consistent in your writing, because these sorts of things are really noticeable to editors. These kinds of issues in your manuscript will, as we said earlier in this session, obscure the great science, the fantastic results, the outcomes of the study. And if editors look through your paper and scan through the article and start to notice inconsistencies in the language, like differences in spelling of the word color or the word gray, for example, then they're just going to think, ah, this paper needs some language work. I'm going to reject it, send it back to the authors and ask them to work more before making a resubmission. That's not what you want. You want your papers, of course, to get sent out for peer review. So that's why we provide this training alongside the Mars Research Hub colleagues. We're helping, hopefully, to provide access to all of these tips and tricks. So here are some other issues that we often see in English academic papers written from colleagues around the world. Avoid emotional words. You can't develop a logical argument if you're using emotional words. So things like progressive, correct, improved, superior, reckless, crank, words like very much more superlative. Use them economically, but they're out of place often in scientific writing. I see lots of papers in my field, paleontology, where people are writing, it's the world's most gigantic or earth shattering, magnificent, marvelous, fantastic. These are informal uses of words in English and should be avoided in academic writing. And then, of course, when you go in and look at adjectives, are you qualifying the absolute? Because, of course, some adjectives like sterile or unique they are absolute, they can't be modified. You can't be quite sterile or fairly sterile or very sterile. Something is either sterile or it's not. So these are absolute adjectives, they can't be modified. Lots of authors write, my Petri dish was very sterile or it was fairly sterile. So an object is unique. And although somebody can be recently pregnant, they can't be slightly pregnant. So keep this in mind as well, because these kinds of issues, these kinds of language questions, when read by a native speaker, will make your language sound a little bit strange. Here are some examples of misplaced or dangling modifiers, pronoun antecedent problems. The difficulty here, of course, is that you know exactly what you're referring to, but your readers don't. So always keep your readers 
in mind. The readers, of course, are the most important people in academic publishing. Using multiple regression techniques, the animals in experiment one were. In assessing the damage, the plants exhibited numerous legions. The spiders were inadvertently discovered while repairing a faulty growth chamber. So these are examples from editing work. Have a look at these. Is the meaning clear? And I would say that in all of these examples, the authors, of course, knew what they meant, but it's not clear to the person reading the paper. Were the, the spiders were repairing the growth chamber? That's what that last sentence seems to be implying. So when you write, think about these issues, your word use, qualifying the absolute, using words that are consistent, and then my own personal favorite, avoiding those verbal obscurantisms, using simple words, because it has long been known that, usually means that the writer has just not bothered to look up the reference. Correct to an order of magnitude. What does that even mean? It probably means that the answer was wrong. Almost reached significance at the 5% level. That usually means a selective interpretation of your results. So be careful, use simple words. My own personal favorite comes from a former colleague that I worked with for years who comes from Switzerland. He used to always start a lot of his sentences with the phrase, be that as it may. And of course, that's unnecessary. You can cut those kinds of phrases out. Text is easier to understand if simple words and phrases are used to replace more complex or foreign words. So why write analogous when you can write similar? Utilize, use, terminate, and end. Of course, words like however, nevertheless, indeed, meanwhile, at the same time, be that as it may, can be used to link phrases together, but they should be used sparingly. Don't use them, as my friend from Switzerland used to do, all of the time. It's very, very important to keep that in mind. So confusion and redundant words. That and which is a big one. These two words can help to make your intended meanings and relationships unmistakable. If the clause can be admitted without leaving the modified noun incomplete, then which? The lawnmower, which is broken, is in the garage. It encloses the clause within commas or parentheses. Otherwise, use that. The lawnmower that is broken is in the garage, and so is the lawnmower that works. Which and that are often mixed up by people, and there are actually quite simple rules for the use of these words. And again, redundancy is very, very common in English academic writing. You can cut it out of your own writing. That man is blue rather than that man is blue in color, small in size, rectangular in shape, tenuous in nature are all examples of redundancy from recent editing work, redundancy in words. Cut down the words, keep your readers in mind, signal your research question, keep a consistent order, repeat those key terms, keep a consistent point of view, put parallel ideas in parallel forms, and most importantly, one topic per sentence. Topic sentences with transitions and key terms. So drilling down, you're going to let your readers know exactly what your research question is. You set up an expectation for the rest of the paper using explicit phrases and using question words in a lot of your writing. So whether, which, stating your hypothesized effect, identifying your types of variables and study design. Also, never use contractions in formal academic writing. I didn't. We can't. I haven't. These should be written out in full. Big mistake that lots of people make is the use of the word data. Of course, that's plural. So the data were collected, not the data was collected. The data were collected on January the 21st, 2001. Direct quotes are worth avoiding unless you're presenting another author's specific definition or original label. We recommend that you always try to paraphrase. And I have other content. We have other courses. We have other webinars training on how to be an effective 
paraphraser in academic writing, taking care, of course, to properly attribute the sources of all of your statements. Read and reread your references. You'd be amazed, flabbergasted, surprised, bowled over by the number of authors who submit papers to international journals without having read all of their references or even checked that their references are actually the references that they are citing. So read and reread your references. Also review your writing. Have your colleagues or talk to your friends or talk to people in your field and ask them to review your writing before it goes to an international journal because this will help you to organize sentences into a logical order. We're also here to help. So reach out to me, reach out to Naran. We're always happy to provide you with editing services. Your sentence construction then is very important. The purpose of any paper is to convey information and ideas. And so this is not done with long involved sentences. Keep your sentences short, 20 to 30 words in length, one idea or two related ideas at the maximum. Words have precise meaning and of course using them correctly adds clarity and precision to your prose. If you're using pronouns, make sure that your meaning is plain because a pronoun usually deputizes for the nearest previous noun of the same number. The cows ate the food, they were white. What does that mean? The cows ate the food, it was white. Are we talking about the cows or are we talking about the food? You can see in this example that if you change the pronoun, then you're going to change the meaning of the sentence. Of course, correct spelling, including the use of plurals. Words have alternative spellings, as we've talked about already. So if you're going to use a misspelling, you're going to end up using a misused word. And probably the most common example of this in English writing is the difference between practice and practice. So the plural of many words in English is achieved, of course, by adding an S or an ES to the singular. But of course, many words are the same form in both the singular and plural. Other words are already plural, such as people and equipment. So don't use peoples unless you're referring to different groups of people or different ethnic groups and equipments and adopted words take on the plural from the original language. So datum becomes data, fungus becomes fungi, for example. So concrete and not abstract to achieve your clarity and precision. Secession of plant growth operated in some of the plots. What does that mean? A secession can't operate. Some of the plots of plants did not grow during the trial. And abstract nouns. The measurement of storm intensity involves recording staff to be available both day and night on a 24 hour basis. Confusing, hard to understand. To measure storm intensity, recording staff have to be in duty throughout the day and night. And again, use of that present participle. After standing in boiling water for an hour, examine the flask. Well, what does that mean? It sounds like the experimenter was the one standing in the boiling water. So you're going to be thinking and hopefully we're going to help you with lots of these issues. Punctuation, colons and semicolons, when to use them. A colon is used when a list or explanation follows, whereas a semicolon is used to separate two or more related clauses, provided each clause forms a full sentence. So these are important definitions. If you're going to make a list, Start off by using a colon and then breaking up the components of that list with semicolons, whereas a comma is put into a sentence to denote a brief pause between groups of words. I will show you the paper about which I was speaking, but it's not as useful as I first thought. Or to separate subclauses. Professor Brown, who is in charge of recruiting for the university, said that the latest estimates were higher than those of this time last year. Year. And also you can use commas as well as semicolons to separate items in a list with the exception of the last two. So finally, some practical tips for academic writing. Ladies and gentlemen, try to be more or less specific. Avoid cliches like the plague, their old hat. Verbs has to agree with their subjects. Prepositions are not words to end sentences with. And don't start a sentence with a conjunction. Is it wrong to ever split an infinitive? 
parenthetical remarks, however relevant, are usually unnecessary. Also, never ever use repetitive redundancies. No sentence fragments, contractions aren't good style and shouldn't be used in formal writing. Do not be redundant. Do not use more words than necessary. One should never generalize. One word sentences, eliminate. Eliminate commas that are not necessary. Never use a big word when a diminutive one will suffice. Kill those exclamation points. Use your words correctly, irregardless of how others use them. Understatement is always the absolutely best way to put forth earth shaking ideas. Use the apostrophe in its proper place and admit it when it's not needed. And who needs rhetorical questions? And finally, proofread your work carefully to see if you left any words out. Of course, those last two slides are just a bit of fun, but we've talked about the most common mistakes in English. Plagiarism, tenses, spelling conventions, inappropriate word use and word use confusion. Very important to understand, of course, English communication and writing skills are what we are all about teaching and training. If you know about some of the most common mistakes, you can know how to avoid them. We are Research Square Company. We are a preprint server, the largest in the world, more than three and a half million preprints uploaded to our preprint server over the last few years. So have a look at that. If you're interested in sharing your research with the world faster and more effectively, maybe preprinting is something that you'd like to do. We've also talked about digital editing. And thank you so much for joining us. I always provide a discount code for all of our services. My name's Gareth. Thank you so much for the chance to do this. And hopefully, Moran is still here to jump back in in case there are any questions or comments from our session today. Naran. Yeah, you thank you so much, Gareth. It was a wonderful lecture, right? Dear audience, I guess you had enjoyed it so much. <laughs> Gareth, Sahar is asking a question. She's asking if we can start a sentence by stating a number or percent. Can we do that? You can, of course, but you shouldn't start with the actual numerical number if you're going to start a sentence with 100 percent of the samples um, were tested positive then you need to write that out in full that's one of the rules for using numbers in academic writing so of course in a sentence it's perfectly fine to write 100 and use the percentage sign use the numerals in the sentence but at the beginning of the sentence if you wish to start your sentence 100% of the audience members found the talk to be absolutely terrible. Then you need to write out one the O N E hundred, you know, so that's one of the rules for English um, academic in academic writing. So hopefully to, to that answers your question. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you. This also there is one question. Could you kindly give us a general idea about using passive voice in writing? Yeah, so this is one of the big questions that people always ask. If you can, and the style guides for, for all international academic journals will encourage you to write in the active voice where possible, but about 30% of papers that get submitted and published around the world contain passive voice writing. So if you look at articles published in medical journals, for example, you'll find that about 70% of the voice, 70% of the writing is in the active voice, whereas about 30% is in the passive voice. And key places for using the passive voice, again, could be in the method section or in places where you have to talk about something and be completely unambiguous. I think we have a link certainly I'll share a link to a, an English academic writing, effective writing presentation where we talk in detail about active versus, versus passive voice. But yeah, like there are some rules for when to use passive voice, but generally if you can try to avoid it and try to write, we collected data rather than the data were collected. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Yes. For Yes, yes. I guess, Gareth, we had talked about that in one of the webinars in detail. Yes. Let me check. Uh, yeah, uh, let me check the recordings at mm -hmm. Mars website. Yeah. I guess it's there. Uh, 
and it will answer the, the, the question yeah. uh, mm -hmm. in detail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is there any questions? They are, they are just thanking you and saying it was a wonderful lecture. And uh, I agree with them, by the way. So uh, Great. Thank, thank you so yeah. much for the chance to do this. And if anyone's been trying or trialing our digital editing tool, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get feedback. So if you're keen to tell us about your experiences using the digital editing tool, which again, I'll paste the link here in the chat do get in touch with me or Naran because we're, we're we're looking for feedback and we're looking for testimonials we're looking to improve the tool so so thank you very much that will be that will be much 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 appreciated thank you uh, thank everybody. you so much guys and please dear audience dear researcher give it a try you will find it like magic yeah, Sahar, Sahar from our team has, has tried it. It was very useful, fast and fantastic. So, and I, I, by the way, I had tried it myself too uh, for one of my papers and it went like magic. So please everyone give it a try. There is a free trial, I guess 30 days free trial guys, right? Right, right. Anyone who, go, who clicks on this link um, um, will get, uh, just have to put your email address in, you can get a 30 day free trial. And of course you don't have to pay, you can always use a different email to get another 30 day free trial. <laughs> By the way, it is, it is not that expensive. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> it's not, but you know, like people always find ways around these things, don't they? But the key is that people are using it and we're helping people, that's what we are. Yes, yes, and, and even the paid version, when, when, the, when the free trial ends, you will find it very convenient. So don't worry about it. Just give it a try for now. It will benefit you so much. And please send this back your feedback because we are working hard to improve everything. And even AGE are working hard to improve this tool. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we appreciate your feedback, everybody. Um, and Naran and I greatly appreciate the chance to do these presentations. So if there's something that you're thinking about that you'd like us to do a webinar on, um, maybe there's a gap in your skills or something that you'd like for your university, then do get in touch with us. We'd love to have the chance to, to show up. Yeah, and, of and... course. Everyone, had you heard, Gareth? If there is any gap, any point in the publication process, in the writing, in any topic, you may find it useful and you need it the most to... I don't know, to strengthen your potentials and, and getting your uh, papers published and accepted, of course, because, you know, Gareth, uh, in our population, there is a sort of high rejection rate. Oh, in every, in everywhere, everywhere, re high rejection rates everywhere. People always think that that's something that's typical for their region, but it's not actually, it's something that's typical for everywhere. So unfortunately, everybody finds the same Problem. So if you go and talk to researchers in China or Japan or, you know, Korea or, or Europe here in Hungary or, you know, around here, like anywhere where English is not the native language, um, unfortunately, people feel that like there's a high rejection rate. But journals often have high rejection rates anyway. And of course, editors are looking for reasons not to send your paper out for peer review. So, so for that reason, um, we recommend proofreading, editing services, and in particular, digital, this digital, this AI, artificial intelligence tool for, for looking at your articles. So thanks very much again. Brilliant to have the chance to be here. Thank you so much, Gareth, for this wonderful webinar. And again, everyone, you, you will be mailed with the, the recording link. Don't forget to sign and fill in the certificate form. You will find it now at the chat box to receive your certificate. Post your certificate on the LinkedIn. Let us celebrate how you are spending effectively your time. And if you have any questions, any feedback, don't ever hesitate to reach me, Nuran, or to reach Gareth from Researcher Square. And thank you for attending today. Thank you, dear Gareth.